Emily Carr's Clee Wick, Chapter 20, Kitwankul. When the Indians t told me about the Kitwankul totem poles, I said, how can I get to Kitwankul? Dunno, the Indians replied. White men told me about the Kitwankul poles too, but when I told them I wanted to go there, they advised me, keep out. But the thought of those old Kitwankul poles pulled me. I was at Kitwan Gak, 20 or so miles from Kitwankul. Then a half-breed at Kitwan Gak said to me, the young son of the Kitwankul chief is going in tomorrow with a load of lumber. I asked if he could take you, and he will. How can I get out again? The boy is coming back to Kitwan Gak after two days. The chief's son, Alec, was shy but spoke good English. He said I was to be at the Hudson's Bay store at 8 the next morning. I bought enough food and mosquito oil to last me two days. Then I sat in front of the Hudson's Bay store from 8 to 11 o'clock, waiting. I saw Alec drive past to load his lumber. The wagon had four wheels and a long pole. He tied the lumber to the pole and a sack of oats to the lumber. I was to sit on the oats. Rigged up in front somehow was a place for the driver. No real seat, just a couple of coal oil boxes bound to some boards. Three men sat on the two boxes. The road was terrible. When we bumped, the man on the downside of the boxes fell off. A sturdy old man trudged behind the wagon. Sometimes he rode a bit on the end of the long pole, which tossed him up and down like a seesaw. The old man carried a gun and walked most of the way. The noon sun burnt fiercely on our heads. The oat sack gave me no support to my back, and my feet dangled. I had to clutch the corner of the oak sack, oat sack with one hand to keep from falling off. With the other, I held my small griffin dog. Every minute, I thought we would be pitched off the pole. You could seldom see the old man because of clouds of yellow dust rolling behind the wagon. The scrub growth at the roadside smelt red hot. The scraggy ponies dragged their feet heavily, sweat cut rivers through the dust that was caked on their sides. One of the three men on the front seat of the wagon seemed to be a hero. The other men questioned him all the way, though generally Indians do not talk as they travel. When one of the men fell off the seat, he ran round the wagon to the high side and jumped up again, and all the while he did not stop asking the hero questions. There were so many holes in the road, and the men fell off so often that they were always changing places, like birds on a roost in cold weather. Suddenly, we gave such an enormous bump that we all fell off together, and the horses stopped. When the wheels were not rattling any more, we could hear water running. Then the old man came out of the clouds of dust behind us and said there was a stream close by. We threw ourselves onto our stomachs, put our lips to the water, and drank like horses. The Indians took the bits out of their horses' mouths and gave them food. Then the men crawled under the wagon to eat their lunch in its shade. I sat by the shadiest wheel. It was splendid to put my legs straight out and have the earth support them and the wheel support my back. The old man went to sleep. After he woke and after the horses had pulled the wagon out of the big hole, we rumbled on again. When the sun began to go down, we were in woods and the clouds of mosquitoes were as thick as the clouds of dust, but more painful. We let them eat us because after bumping for seven hours, we were too tired to fight. At last we came to a great dip where the road wound round the edge of a ravine shaped like an oblong bowl. There were trees growing in this earth bowl. It seemed to be bottomless. We were level with the treetops as we looked down. The road was narrow, its edges broken. I was afraid and said, I want to walk. Alec waved his hand across the ravine. Kit one cool, he said, and I saw some gray roofs on the far side of the hollow. After we had circled the ravine and climbed the road on the other side, we would be there, unless we were lying dead in the deep bowl. I said again, I want to walk. Village dogs will kill you and the little dog, said Alec. But I did walk around the bend and up the hill until the village was near. Then I rode into Kitwankul on the oat sack. The dogs rushed out in a pack. The village people came out too. 
They made a fuss over the hero man, clustering about him and jabbering. They paid no more attention to me than to the oat sack. All of them went into the nearest house, taking Alec, the hero, the old man, and the other man with them, and shut the door. I wanted to cry, sticking alone up there on top of the oats and lumber, the sagging horses in front and the yapping dogs all around. Nobody to ask about anything and very tired. Alec had told me I could sleep on the veranda of his father's house because I only had a cot and a tent fly with me and bears came into the village often at night. But how did I know which was his father's house? The dogs would tear me if I got down and there was no one to ask anyway. Some, suddenly, something at the other end of the village attracted the dogs. The pack tore off, and the dust hid me from them. Alec came out of the house and said, We are going to have dinner in this house now. Then he went in again and shut the door. The wagon was standing in the new part of the village. Below us, on the right, I could see a row of old houses. They were dim, for the light was going, but above them, Black and clear against the sky stood the old totem poles of Kitwan Cool. I jumped down from the wagon and came to them. That part of the village was quite dead. Between the river and the poles was a flat of green grass. Above stood the houses, gray and broken. They were in a long, wavering row with wide, windowless fronts. The totem poles stood before them there on the top of a little bank above the green flat. There were a few poles down on the flat, too, and some graves that had fences round them and roofs over the tops. When it was almost dark, I went back to the wagon. The house of Alec's father was the last one at the other end of the new village. It was one great room like a hall and was built of new logs. It had seven windows and two doors. All of the windows were propped open with blue castor oil bottles. I was surprised to find that the old man who had trudged behind our wagon, was Chief Douse, Alec's father. Mrs. Douse was more important than Mr. Douse. She was a chieftainess in her own right and had great dignity. Neither of them spoke to me that night. Alec showed me where to put my bed on the veranda and I hung the fly over it. I ate a dry scrap of food and turned into my blankets. I had no netting and the mosquitoes tormented me. My heart set into the thick dark. Why did I come? And the dark answered, you know. In the morning, the hero man came to me and said, my mother-in-law wishes to speak with you. She does not know English words, so she will talk through my tongue. I stood, I stood before the tall, cold woman. She folded her arms across her body and her eyes searched my face. They were as expressive as if she were saying the words herself instead of using the hero's tongue. My mother-in-law wishes to know why you have come to our village. I want to make some pictures of the totem poles. What do you want our totem poles for? Because they're beautiful and they are getting old now and your people make very few new ones. The young people do not value the poles as the old ones did. By and by, there will be no more poles. I want to make pictures of them so that your young people, as well as the white people, will see how fine your totem poles used to be. Mrs. Douse li Mrs. Douse listened when the young man told her this. Her eyes raked my face to see if I was talking straight. Then she waved her hand toward the village. Go along, she said through the interpreter, and I shall see. She was neither friendly nor angry. Perhaps I was going to be turned out of this place that had been so difficult to get into. The air was hot and heavy. I turned towards the old village with the pup ginger pop at my heels. Suddenly, there was a roar of yelpings, and I saw my little dog putting half a dozen big ones to, <laughs> to rout down the village street. Their tails were flat, their tongues lolled, and they yelped. The douses all rushed out of their house to see what the noise was about, and we laughed together so hard that the strain which before had been between us broke. 
The sun enriched the old poles grandly. They were carved elaborately with great sincerity. Several times the figure, the figure of a woman that held a child was represented. The babies had faces like wise little old men. The mothers expressed all womanhood. womanhood. The big wooden hands holding the child were so full of tenderness they had to be distorted enormously in order to contain it all. Womanhood was strong and kit one cool. Perhaps, after all, Mrs. Douse might let me stay. I sat in front of a totem mother and began to draw, so full of her strange wild beauty that I did not notice the storm was coming, till the totem poles went black, flashed vividly white, and then went black again. Bang upon bang came the clap of thunder. The hills on one side tossed it to the hills on the other. Sheets of rain washed over me. I was beside a grave down on the green flat. Some of the pickets of its fence were gone, so I crawled through onto the grave with ginger pop in my arms to shelter under its roof. S Stinging nettles grew on top of the grave with mosquitoes hiding under their leaves. While I was beating down the nettles with my easel, it struck the head of a big wooden bear squatted on the grave. He startled me. He was painted red. As I sat, sat down upon him, my foot hit something that made a hollow rattling noise. It was a shaman's rattle. This, then, must be a shaman's, a medicine man's grave, and this, the rattle he had used to scare away evil spirits. Shaman worked black magic. His body lay there just a few feet below me in the earth. At the thought, I made a dash for the broken community house on the bank above. All the Indian horses had got their first and taken, uh, had got there first and taken for their shelter, the only corner of the house that had any roof over it. I put my stool near the wall and sat upon it. The water ran down the wall in rivers. The dog shivered under my coat. Both of us were wet to the skin. My sketch sack was so full of water that when I emptied it on the ground, it made the pool we sat in bigger. After two hours, the rain stopped suddenly. The horses held their bones stiff and quivered their skins. It made the rain fly out of their coats and splash me. One by one, they trooped out through a hole in the wall. When their hooves struck the baseboard, there was a sodden thud. Ginger Pop shook her himself too, but I could only drip. Water poured from the eyes of the totems and from the tips of their carved noses. New little rivers trickled across the green flat. The big river was whipped to, to froth. A blur like boiling mist hung over it. When I got back to the new village, I found my bed and things in a corner of the Douse's great room. The hero told me, my mother-in-law says you may live in her house. There is a rocking chair for you. Mrs. Douse acknowledged my gratitude stolidly. I gave Mrs. Mr. Douse a dollar and asked if I might have a big fire to dry my things and make tea. There were two stoves. The one at their end of the room was alight. Soon, mine too was roaring, and it was cozy. When the Indians accepted me as one of themselves, I was very grateful. The people who lived in that big room of the Douses were two married daughters, their husbands, the children, the son Alec, and an orphan girl called Lizzie. The old couple came and went continually, but they ate and slept in a shanty at the back of the new house. This little place had been made round them. The floor was of earth and the walls were of cedar. The fire on the ground sent its smoke through a smoke hole in the roof. Dried salmon hung on racks. The old people's mattress was on the floor. The place was full of themselves. They had breathed themselves into it as a bird with its head under its wing, breathes itself into its own coziness. The Douses were glad for their children to have the big fine house and to be modern, but this was the right sort of place for themselves. Life in the big house was most interesting. A baby swung in its cradle from the rafters. Everyone tossed the cradle as he passed and the baby cooed and gurgled. There was a crippled child of six, six, pinched and white under her brown skin. She sat in a chair all day. And there was orphan Lizzie who would slip out into the wet bushes and come back with a wild strawberry or a flower in her grubby little hand and, kneeling by the sick child's chair, would open her fingers suddenly on the surprise. 
There was no rush, no scolding, no roughness in this household. When anyone was sleepy, he slept. When they were hungry, they ate. If they were sorry, they cried. And if they were glad, they sang. They enjoyed Ginger Pop's fiery temper, the tilt of his nose, and particularly the way he kept the house free of Indian dogs. It was Ginger who bridged the gap between their language and mine with laughter. Ginger's snore was the only sound in that great room at night. Indians sleep quietly. Orphan Lizzie was shy as a rabbit, but completely unselfconscious. It was she who set the food on the table on the big table and cleared away the dishes. There did not seem to be any particular meal times. Lizzie always took a long lick at the top of the jam tin as she passed it. The first morning I woke at the douses, I went very early to wash myself in the creek below the house. I was kneeling on the stones, brushing my teeth. It was very cold. Suddenly I looked up. Lizzie was close by me, watching. When I looked up, she darted away like a fawn, leaving her water pails behind. Later, Mrs. Douse came to my corner of the house, carrying a tin basin. Behind her was Lizzie with a tiny glass cream pitcher full of water, and behind Lizzie was the hero. My mother-in-law says the river is too cold for you to wash in. Here is water in a basin for you. Everyone watched my washing next morning. The washing of my ears interested them most. One day after work, I found the Douse family all sitting round on the floor. In the center of the group was Lizzie. She was beating something in a pail, beating it with her hands. Her arms were blobbed with pink froth to the elbows. Everyone stuck his hand into Lizzie's pail and hooked out some of the froth in the crook of his fingers, then took long, delicious licks. They invited me to lick, too. It was soperlali, or soapberry. It grows in the woods. When you beat the berry, it froths up and has a queer, bitter taste. The Indians love it. For two days, from dawn till dark, I worked down in the old part of the village. On the third day, Alec was to take me back to Kitwangak. But that night, it started to rain, and it rained for three days and three nights without stopping. The road was impossible. I had only provisioned for two days, had been there five days, and had given all the best bits from my box to the sixth child. All the food I had left for the last three days was a hard tack and raisins. I drank hot water and rocked my hunger to the tune of the rain beating on the window. Ginger Pop munched hardtack, unconcerned. Amusing everybody. The Indians would have shared the loaf and jam tin with me, but I did not tell them that I had no food. The thought of Lizzie's tongue licking the jam tin stopped me. When it rained, the Indians drowsed like flies, heavy as the day itself. On the sixth day of my stay in Kitwankul, the sun shone again, but we had to wait a bit for the puddles to drain. I straightened out my obligations and said goodbye to Mr. and Mrs. Douse. The light wagon that was taking me out seemed luxurious after the thing I had come in on. I climbed up beside Alec. He gathered up his reins and giddy up. Mrs. Douse, followed by her husband, came out of the house and waved a, waved a halt. She spoke to Alec. My mother wants to see your pictures. But I showed her every one before they were packed. At the time, I had thought her stolidly indifferent. My mother wishes to see the pictures again. I clambered over the back of the wagon, unpacked the wet canvases, and opened the sketchbooks. She went through them all. The two best poles in the village belonged to Mrs. Douse. She argued and discussed with her husband. I told Alec to ask if his mother would like to, to have me give her pictures of her poles. If so, I would send them through the Hudson's Bay store at Kitwangak. Mrs. Douse's neck loosened. Her head nodded violently and I saw her smile for the first time. Repacking, I climbed over the back of the seat to Alec. Get up. The reins flapped, we were off. The dust was laid, everything was keen and fresh. Indeed, the appetites of the mosquitoes were very keen. When I got back to Kitwangak, the mounted police came to see me. You have been to Kitwankul? Yes. How did the Indians treat you? Splendidly. Learn their lesson, eh, said the man. We have had no end of trouble with those people. Chased missionaries out and drove surveyors off with axes. Simply won't have whites in their village. 
I would never have advised anyone going in, particularly a woman. No, I would certainly have said keep out. Then I am glad I did not ask for your advice, I said. Perhaps it is because I am a woman that they were so good to me. One of the men you went in the wagon with was straight from jail, a fierce, troublesome customer. Now I knew who the hero was.